today's episode. It's brought to you by today's sponsor, AG1 from Athletic Greens. Look, it's 2022. I don't know about you, but every year I'm like, let's try and be a little better. Let's try and be a little healthier. And I know that I'm the sort of person who's got some gaps in my diet. Like, I like to, you know, not eat too badly, but I also know I'm not the healthiest eater in the world, and I definitely don't eat all the vegetables that I should because I prefer meat and starch and, you know, the more delicious creations from uh, from the kitchen. But what I do is I have Athletic Greens, and it fills those gaps in my diet because how many vitamins and minerals does this thing have? It's crazy. There's a huge list on the back, and I don't want to count them all, but they normally have it written down for me. I don't know, I can't find it here, but it's a ridiculous number. Look at the back of this pack. Look at all these look at all these things. It fills all of those gaps. Plus, I've got this uh this came with it. This is a liquid food supplement. 600 servings of vitamin D, which are what I do is I shake it up in here every morning. I typically have it with a coffee, which I've also got right here. And I just uh, just knock it back. I mean, you think kind of, it looks super green, you know, like, oh, I don't know how that looks. That doesn't look so tasty. But it tastes great. You just have it. It even smells good. I knock that back. I have some coffee with it. I have a little drop of the vitamin D with it. And it's just easy. It's just, I feel, I don't know. I have it with the coffee and I just feel like, I don't know, just sets me up for the day. Ready to go. Raring to record some videos. And look, all of this stuff comes with it. So you get this canister. There's a scoop inside there. You put the stuff from the pack in there for easy storage. They changed this to a metal thing, which is awesome because I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say this, but they had a really cool ceramic one before, which I dropped on the floor and it smashed into a thousand pieces. So no worries with this. Right now, what's the deal? You get a year's free supply. So this actually comes free, the vitamin D3 and K2. Plus you get five free travel packs with your first purchase. It's a game changer for supporting your immune system. That's cool. AG1 provides your body with everything it needs for optimal performance every single day. Again, Athletic Greens giving you one year's supply of vitamin D and uh, five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you need to do is go to athleticgreens.com forward slash TCC and you'll get all of this stuff and support yourself with AG1 from Athletic Greens. And now back to the video. Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of the brand brand new casual. What are we doing? It's the casual criminalist. I'm Simon. Great, great job, Simon. So far you've got the intro wrong and then you did a burp. Couldn't have done that before we get started, could you? Uh, welcome back to The Casual Criminalist. This one is, uh, ch- well, I want to say Charles Sabraj, and I know it's uh, Charles Sabraj, because I looked it up, and apparently this dude is French. He's called the Bikini Killer. Uh, I just recorded a couple of uh, more heisty, less murdery episodes, like late last week, and uh, honestly, I'm feeling quite okay about diving into a killer. Because uh, before that, I recorded Gein. And after recording Gein, I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> Why are we doing this? Why are we talking about anuses being cut off? Not right. It's not right. Oh, if you're new here, what happens here? I've been written a script by one of the fantastic writers for this channel. This one comes from Chris. Thank you, Chris. I've never read it before, uh, other than the name, which I looked up the pronunciation of. Uh, so we're just going to get into it. It's called A Cold Read. It's going to be fun. I mean, it's probably not. The guy's called The Bikini Killer. It's going to be fun in the same way Ed Gein was fun, which wasn't fun. Oh my god. Let's go. It's March 1986 and a prisoner is sitting in Tihar Jail, a maximum security facility in New Delhi, India. Oh god. I just... Whenever... I mean... I don't want to say, like, prison's great. But, like, if anyone... If you're, like, you know, you don't want to go to prison. Like generally not a good place to be but then it's like yeah 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 but i when you think of prison i always think of like european prison or even american prison which i'm sure is worse like than european prison but then it's like well at least you're not in like mexican prison or at least you're not in like where's that bangkok hilton (laughs) it's obviously in bangkok isn't it simon and it's like yeah it's just like that's not what you want it's like there's no rules and it's much worse and so i just think of india as a place where there's a lot of people in india so I imagine Indian prisons are really overcrowded and really intense. It's also hot. So it's going to be war- it's going to be a bad time. It's going to it's not going to be good. But this is no ordinary prisoner. His life is one of fine dining and conjugal visits and he seems to have freedom of the whole facility. Wait, never mind. Indian jail does not sound that bad. 
A little while earlier, a new guard had shown up on his first day of work, only to be told that the do- job he'd been hired from didn't actually exist. He encountered this prisoner wandering the halls and, assuming he was some sort of senior official, complained of his situation to him. The prisoner went into an office and talked to the new guard's boss. When the prisoner came back out, he told the guard that he was to start work this afternoon. Wait, so this guy's just strolling around the prison people assume he's in charge, when well, he's actually just a convict? One day, the prisoner claims it's his birthday and decides to throw a party. He gets his contacts to bring sweets and other treats inside, which he shares around the staff. They gladly partake, apparently not worried that he's actually in for poisoning 60 French students. Astonishingly, the sweets are poisoned, and practically the whole staff is incapacitated. Oh my god, what are you doing, staff? If a guy who is a poisoner is offering you sweets, it's like almost a cli- it is a cliché! Don't eat the sweets! Good lord! In the ensuing confusion, there's nothing you should be confused about, this is blindingly obvious. The prisoner, along with about a dozen others, simply walk outside. He's recaptured within e- weeks while dining in a fancy restaurant in Goa, which was his plan all along. The whole stunt had been an elaborate ruse to lengthen his sentence in order to run down the clock on a 20-year statute of limitations, which would see him deported to Thailand and near certain execution. Oh my god. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Wait, so this guy's in Indian prison where he's living a cushy life and he's like, I don't want to go to that Bangkok Hilton. That's not right. They're going to shoot me in the face. The prisoner in question is one Charles Sabraj. Early life and crimes. One of the biggest problems with someone like Sabraj is that he's always been a professional liar and fantasist. On multiple occasions, he's claimed to have never killed anyone, to have only killed bad people, to have killed up to a hundred people, to have worked for the CIA to disrupt triad arms sales to the Taliban, and to have committed his crimes as some kind of anti-colonialist activism. <laughs> this guy is like, he's living with, it's like the guy who writes the biography and it's like clearly embellished. All right, mate. I'll so just go take a shower then, huh? This combined with the chaotic nature of the hippie trail, more on that later, means that it's actually quite difficult to pin down exactly what he did and to whom. Wait, is this the dude who was that there was that the there is that Netflix show about who was murdering all those uh, backpackers? Oh, this is going to be good. I mean, not good, it's horrible, but this is a story. On top of this, the media, especially French and South Asian papers, lapped up his stories, both true and untrue, casting him as some sort of debonair, raffles-type character, regardless of the pain this might cause his victims' families or the impact on ongoing investigations. There are, however, some things that we can know for sure, and what is abundantly clear is that Charles Charles Sabraj was a despicable lying scavenger who got a swath of swathe? Someone told me that I was pronouncing swath wrong. But then I looked it up and there were multiple accepted pronunciations, and so I'm just like, whatever. (laughs) A swath of murder and betrayal across several continents with no apparent motive other than satisfying his pathological vanity and financing his travels. Sabraj was born on April 6, 1944, in what was then Saigon as Hotchand Bawan. Oh my god. Bawani. Garamukha Sabraj. Oh, there's a pronunciation guide, which is equally confusing. Um, Saigon is Sri Lanka nowadays. His father was an Indian tailor who rejected the boy and denied paternity, and his mother was one of his young Vietnamese shop assistants who always blamed her son for ending her dalliance with her boss. Vietnam at the time was French Indochina, and the Viet Minh were fighting their war of independence against the French colonialists. Needless to say, the country was in a violent upheaval, and biographers affirm that Charles was witness to a great deal of violence in his early years. Why has he got such... He must have taken this French name later. Because at first I'm like, he's just some French dude. But he's obviously not. These people are different. They are not French. His mother eventually married an officer of the occupying French force, Lieutenant Alphonse de Rau, who was ready to adopt Garamuk, but not give him his name. De Rau, who was diagnosed with shell shock or PTSD, was soon inv- invalided? 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 Like, sent back home with an injury. Uh, back to France, taking his family with him. Sabraj was converted to Catholicism, probably by default, attending a Catholic boarding school in France, and took the name Charles, reportedly owing to his strong Charlie Chaplin impersonation. So he wasn't just a murderous con man in training, he was also deeply irritating. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I went to school with uh, a bunch of kids from, oh, one kid was from Korea, a couple of kids were from China. And they'd always, they had names, of course. <laughs> well done, Simon. Of course, they had names. They had like, um, 
you know chinese or korean names but they'd often choose like names that were super like you know they'd adopt an english name just to make life easier for us apparently <laughs> i don't know if people still do this it feels like quite a, a 90s thing to do I, I don't know whatever um and there was one dude called whitney there was another guy called jay and it's just like that's interesting i don't think your name is actually whitney <laughs> which uh i don't know <laughs> let's just move on sabraj was soon feeling neglected relative to his new half siblings and he had somehow concocted a vision of his biological father as a heroic figure he began committing petty crimes and manipulating his half-brother, Andre de Rowe, into shoplifting on his behalf. When his mother confronts him about this, Charles, ten years old at the time, explained, There's always some idiot who's prepared to do whatever I want. Charles is sounding a bit like a psycho, isn't he? He's like, uh, is this not, not narcissism? But when you're very good at manipulating people. Hello? <laughs> Can you guys hear that? Someone just started drilling into the wall. Oh god, have they begun already? I uh That is so loud. Well, this is going to be annoying. I got a letter this morning in my uh in my email from the building manager of my office and he's like, "Yeah, the people upstairs are about to start renovations." It seems they have begun. Uh and seeing as I actually have to make content, I guess we're just going to continue and hope that this mic is not that sensitive. Either that or I'm about to start recording at night. He also stowed away aboard at least two ships, passing, trying to run away to his biological father before being discovered and returned at great expense to his family. These features of his personality, a sense of victimhood, peripatetic wanderlust, and intensive manipulation of those around him would come to define his entire future life. After a childhood full of petty crime, reformatories, and two sets of parents on different continents who made it very clear they could very easily do without him, Sabraj ended up in big boy prison for the first time in 1963 at the age of 19. By now, he was estranged from his family, a more or less hardened offender fond of car theft, fraud, and armed robbery, and a promising psychopath. At Poissy, he became friends with a wealthy young prison visitor, Felix Descon. Prison visitors are volunteers who help inmates with legal matters, letter writing, and other services. Felix was a kindly young man from a wealthy family and was so impressed with Sabraj, he invited him to stay with him upon his release. Whilst living with Felix, Sabraj was introduced to Parisian high society as well as mixing regularly with drug dealers, professional gamblers, and jewel smugglers. This guy's life... It, did we say this oh no it's been this netflix series hasn't it uh i like this is this is a movie like this is absolutely a movie plot this dual experience allowed him to become what was later described as a social chameleon able to be plausible and popular in almost any company while trading on felix's good name and contacts to commit a series of robberies and scams sabraj met charles compagnon a french girl of uh chantal sorry chantal not charles a uh, French girl of good of a good family who lived at home with her parents. I don't know, like, if you've been handed this golden ticket, because like, I get the feeling this guy's quite charming. So, uh, basically, he makes friends with some dude who volunteers at a prison who is in high society. You And he wants, he's like, come live with me after you leave prison. This will be great. We'll hang out. We'll be buds. At that point, be like, okay, I'm done with crime. I'm just going to be a good boy in high society and find some rich girl to marry. <laughs> Dude, why do you have to be a criminal still? You've literally been handed a golden pass to, like, the rest of your life. Just f***ing take it and do not let go. There was a long courtship as Chantal knew her family would struggle to accept him as a son-in-law. Eventually, Sabraj appears to have had a bit of a meltdown about this while speeding along with the poor girl in a stolen car. The pressure of this situation led her to finally consent to be his fiance. Later that day, Sabraj was arrested and jailed for stealing that very car. After an eight-month stint back in Poissy, Charles and Chantal were married. Wow. <laughs> Dude, it's like, I've got to impress this girl's family, so what I'm going to do is steal a car and go to prison for eight months. <laughs> okay. Her family's consent probably had something to do with her pregnancy, announced shortly after the wedding. Oh my. So when was this? 1960s? Okay, yeah. Sabraj was on a pretty good wicket in Paris, but his self-destructive compulsions meant that one day in 1970 he was forced to pack up his pregnant wife and scant belongings into a stolen MG. They later drove through Eastern Europe under false papers, robbing tourists they met along the way until finally setting in Bombay, now Mumbai. Whoa. <laughs> Dude, that is a drive. It's like, yeah, we're driving to Paris, to Eastern Europe. Okay, it's a few hours. We're driving to Bombay through the Middle East. <laughs> it's like, that is a journey. Back in the day, especially. In an MG, look, not exactly the most reliable cars in the world, are they? Do MGs still exist? I don't think they make MGs anymore. They looked cool, but 
they were always a bit sh weren't they i mean they're british so they're not going to be that reliable in the meantime their daughter asha was born and shah began running a stolen car fencing business selling european vehicles to homesick frets homesick french expatriates in order to feed both his family and his compulsive gambling habits one thing i'd think about uh, french expatriates is that they don't particularly miss their cars because they're french <laughs> While it's quite difficult to separate half-truths and outright lies from the various accounts, many of which rely heavily on interviews with Sabraj, it seems he spent this period in India involved in various rackets in the stolen, as well as the stolen car business. He seems to have been smuggling drugs, trading and smuggling gemstones, committing short cons, and running various rackets. All the while, his gambling debts kept running ahead of his income, which culminated in Sabraj becoming involved in a harebrained scheme to rob a jewelry store at the Ashoka Hotel by drilling down into it from the floor above. Um, this dude's like, I, I mean, this guy's, it's such a, it's such a broad spectrum of crimes and life. Like, you've got this high society life going on, and then you're like, I'm just gonna go smuggle drugs in India. I don't know if India's like those other countries in Asia, but it's like, yo. Smuggling drugs ain't smuggling gemstones. Smuggling drugs ends up with you in a noose. Your neck in a noose. You're being hanged. Just in case that wasn't clear, you're welcome. Some reports say he held a flamenco dancer hostage in her room while they drilled, which is a typical Sabraj-esque detail. Sounds like it's a little bit made up, doesn't it, old Charles? doesn't it? Whatever the facts is certainly true, Sabraj and crew weren't the master criminals they thought themselves. After three days of drilling, little progress had been made because drilling through a floor requires a survey, an understanding of soundproofing, a plan for debris control and removal, and specialist equipment. In the end, Sabraj lured the owner up to the room, took the keys from him at gunpoint, and tied him up. He then fled to the airport, where it became apparent he was no better at knots than he was at drilling. The manager had escaped and alerted the police. Well, at some point he's going to escape and alert the police. You just got to hope that you're out of there before that happens. Eventually someone's going to discover him or discover that he's been robbed when they find his smelly body. Um It's okay, we can make fun of it because he didn't really die. So it was that in 1973 Sabraj was arrested and imprisoned, but he didn't make it, did he? He somehow procured a syringe, filled his mouth with his own blood, and faked a perforated ulcer, which got him into the hospital. Here his wife Chantal visited him, smuggling chloroform, which he used to drug the guard and escape. Oh rit that's amazing. She took a dose as well in an attempt to establish her own innocence. Predictably, this didn't work, and she was imprisoned as an accomplice. Sabraj fled and was recaptured and borrowed money from his father to pay bail. Chantal had also been bailed so they fled Kabul, where Shah continued conning and robbing travelers. Why are you granting him bail? He literally chloroformed, a, he faked an ulcer, chloroformed a guard, and escaped. At that point, you'll be like, yo, 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 no bail. <laughs> this guy obviously likes escaping, and if we let him go, he's obviously not coming back. After a little while, his wanderlust got the better of him again, and the whole happy family went off to Kabul Airport, where he was promptly arrested and jailed for non-payment of rent. Unbelievably, Sabraj escaped from prison in Kabul pretty much exactly the same way. He fled to Iran, abandoning uh, his family and Chantal, tired of their life of crime, but incredibly still loyal to Sabraj, took her daughter to go live quietly in France, and thus ended Charles Sabraj's long criminal apprenticeship and short first marriage. Shortly after this, Sabraj was joined by his half-brother Andre, the very same one he'd manipulated into shoplifting for him all of those years ago in Istanbul. They went on a crime spree, defrauding, robbing and smuggling between Greece and Turkey. They were eventually arrested in Athens. Sabraj's rap sheet by this time was thick enough to earn him a hefty sentence, whereas Andre's was much slimmer. Discussing things between them, Sabraj managed to persuade Andre to swap identities, banking mistakenly on the Greek and Turkish authorities hating each other so much they'd never cooperate. So Andre claimed to be Charles, who had somehow managed to escape from prison in exactly the same way as his many previous jailbreaks, with the intention of unmasking himself once Charles was clear and doing his much lighter sentence. Andre, however, was to discover that this actually, that was actually quite a clever plan. I gotta say, Andre ever was to discover that not only would the Greeks and the Turks absolutely cooperate in their cr criminal investigations, they also lacked any sense of humor about being messed about. So Andre found himself sentenced to 18 years in a Turkish prison. Uh-oh, your clever plan did not work out. Also, again, Charles is a master of manipulation. He basically manipulated this his half-brother to come and commit crimes with him, and then when he gets busted for said crimes, he manipulates him to basically take the rap. I kind of would like to meet this Charles character, because it's just, I, like, how? How are you so incredibly good at this? The Betrayal 
It's easy to forget just how random the late 20th century was. Some theorists reckon that the massive trauma of the world wars followed by the apocalyptic tension of the nuclear age combined in the West to create a kind of temporal scar, ending the modern world and birthing the postmodern reality that we live in today. Others think it was the world shrinking through commercial air travel, which caused a kind of cultural and psychological ferment aided by cheap drugs and increasing incomes. The day, yeah, the world has changed an awful lot. I mean, yes, since the Cold War, but especially you go back 150 years. Like, go back to that Industrial Revolution, and it's like, oh my god, 150 years is not that long of a time. I used to think 150 years is forever. But then you live through 30 years, and you're like, well, that wasn't that long, was it? And it's only like five times more than that. Which is insane that five of my lifetimes ago, the Industrial Revolution was happening. Which is absolutely mental. <laughs> The Daily Mail was convinced that the decline of Christianity in the class system had spawned a generation of soft, entitled, drug-addled sex maniacs who would cause the end of Western civilization. Uh, American listeners, if you're not aware, Daily Mail is like, um, I want to say it's like Fox News, except somehow worse. It's like, what's that new, is it New York Post, the one that just has the silly headlines? Uh, like, it's a proper tabloid. Daily Mail is like Fox News combined with the new york post like with the really splashy headlines like you'll see on the daily mail immigrants are ruining country and then they'd be like mm, is that but no no <laughs> not really are they but that's their explanation for everything. Whatever the cause is, the fact is that from around 1970, thousands of Western tourists began drifting through Southern Europe, the Middle East, and Asia in search of enlightenment, healing crystals, spiritual gurus, hard drugs, or some combination of the above. This was called the hippie trail. It's very likely, if you're a middle-class white person, that your parents or grandparents spent part of their youth stumbling around Nepal, Afghanistan, or Greece, high as kites, and attempting to roger and meditate their way into Nirvana. Of course, they mostly just came home again and got jobs in banks and real estate agencies, but they're obviously very spiritually enlightened bankers and real estate agents. Unless they met someone like Charles Sobrage, of course. In that case, they're probably dead. Oh yeah, I totally forgot he murders people. I was like, because I forgot the introduction because I recorded it yesterday. I'm making this whole episode thinking this is just about a con man. And I'm like, yeah, I'd like to meet this guy. How did he become so charming? And it's like, Simon, he's a serial killer. Do you not? Did you not? I, I totally forgot he's a serial killer. Oh, God. Imagine you're one half of a happy couple in your 20s. Life has everything to offer. A job, marriage, a comfortable existence in one of the Netherlands' fantastically livable cities. Okay, I guess when, when I, was, I was just picturing myself in my 20s. Like, yeah, yeah, it's pretty happy, having a good time. And it, but I... The Netherlands, okie dokie. Children, perhaps with the vibrant, adventurous person by your side who's chosen to join you in your travels, both literal and figurative. But that's all for the future. First, you're going to see the world, have a wild adventure or two, and maybe find something deeper, some key to what all our earthly toils might possess in the way of meaning. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I've traveled a bunch. I've done, like, I guess the, not this hippie trail, but, like, the modern backpacker circuit i've lived abroad I, I still i mean i don't really see myself as living abroad anymore or like um whatever but it's like because i've lived it just so long i'm just basically this is where i live um but i never i was like i didn't really expect to go out there and smoke a bunch of weed and then be like i found happiness because i don't really think that that happens i mean sure i guess some people find enlightenment enlightenment but one of my favorite quotes is like, how does it go? Uh, Simon, try and remember one of your favorite quotes. Like, Wherever you go, there you are. I'm like, I don't, I think I've definitely grown, but that's more like a process of just time passing and life experience rather than, you know, <laughs> I don't know, smoking too much weed with a bunch of hippies. I just, I don't really buy into that. But that's not saying I don't think travel is, isn't amazing. Like, I don't really like it now because it's like a pain in the ass and I'm just an old man. But back in the day, I was like, hmm nothing was cooler. You get to Hong Kong, marveling at the bustling markets and towering skyscrapers, the sense that the whole world has gathered here on this tiny rock to eat a dizzying array of cuisines, buy and sell everything under the sun, and hustle its way into the rest of Asia. It's here you meet an enigmatic figure of inde indeterminate ethnicity claiming to be a drug dealer and a jewel smuggler, an anti-establishment Robin Hood come Dick Turpin, sticking it to the man and carving out a life for himself and his followers on his own terms. Uh-oh. Did we just say, and his followers? It's getting cold. 
salty. He's also got some friends, a mysterious Indian called Ajay Chowdhury, who seems to be his right hand man, and a Canadian girlfriend called Marie Leclerc. This, of course, is Charles Sabraj, who you know as Alain Gautier, a charming, edgy man with a dark appeal, and to all appearances, the key to exactly the kind of adventure that you've been looking for. I could, I absolutely can see myself in this position, <laughs> which is so dark. You're invited to Thailand. At that point, I'll be like, uh, no, nah, I got, I got other plans, my dude. I don't, I don't want to come to Thailand with you. <laughs> where he has a little community of defiant outcasts living as they please and traveling the world at will, and you decide to join him at his place in the resort town of Pattaya. Once there, you both immediately fall ill, which isn't that disturbing as it's an occupational hazard when traveling through places with varying hygiene standards and exotic food. Oh boy, is it. <laughs> there are times like traveling to like weird places and eating cheap food off the street, and you're like, uh-oh, I'm shitting myself and puking at the same time. <laughs> What you don't know is that you've been poisoned by the very people who are pretending to nurse you to health, and this is the scam that Sabraj and his brood have run multiple times as a way of gaining followers to do their bidding. Isn't it going to be a bit obvious when the fifth person is like, yeah, as soon as I arrived, I got really sick and then I got better? I'd be like, are we being poisoned? I'm going to leave this Pattaya organization. While you're recovering under the generous ministrations of the charming Charles, a woman called Charmaine, Charmaine Carew shows up. She seems like just another stray pulled into this man's inner mystery circle. But she's actually the girlfriend of Atali Akim, whom Sabraj has recently murdered, and she's come for answers. So it's without any understanding of the danger you're in that you suddenly fall ill again, and Charles and Jay and Charle and AJ hustle you out of the house in the middle of the night, groggy and unable to resist. Perhaps the last thing you see is these two men as you pass out from the drugs they poisoned you with. Or perhaps they're conscious as they throttle you, your last memory, the image of your lover being brutally strangled, the sound of their hyoid bones breaking as they struggle to breathe. Oh my god, what the f***? <laughs> okay. I feel like I've just been led, you know, this is put in the second person, however you describe that. So it's like, I've just, I'm on my own choose your own adventure. And the only choice is death. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. Or perhaps worst of all, you might still be conscious as they splash accelerant over your... Oh my god, they set us on fire. F man. I wouldn't have gone to Thailand. <laughs> Don't do this. Don't follow the weird, charming stranger. <laughs> if you're listening to this and you're on some backpacking adventure, don't... Always remember you're not invincible. Like, don't... And, and I've been there. Like, I was in my, like, late no early 20s like 20 21 and uh, i was like yeah 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 it'll be a brilliant idea to do all this wildly dangerous stuff which in retrospect i'm like what the f was i up to like it's like yeah 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 let's get a motorcycle i rode a motorcycle around cambodia for a month and the helmet was just a joke and the roads are a joke and the dude i was riding with just one day falls into a hole he cuts up his leg real bad and we're just like hey and we just carry on riding and we'd just be riding these bikes stupid fast. And I'm like, that was, a, that was a bad idea. And that was not the most stupid thing I've done. But just remember, you're not invincible. Like, looking back on it, I'm like, oh my god, I really thought I couldn't die. And now I'm like, oh my god, everything's going to kill me. <laughs> Such was the passing of 29-year-old uh, Hank Bitania, a 25-year-old Cornelia, and 25-year-old Cornelia Hemker. And it's not as if these murders were particularly exceptional. So typical were they, in fact, that Hank and Cornelia's bodies were misidentified as another missing pair that Zabraj would murder the same way shortly afterwards in Katmandu. And what of Charmaine Corot? She was drugged and stripped, dressed in a bikini, and left to drown in the waters off Pattaya. This was exactly the same MO as the murder of a young American, Teresa Knowlton, usually cited as the first Zabraj murder, who was found in a tidal pool in the Gulf of Thailand. It was these two murders which would earn Sabraj the nickname The Bikini Killer, amongst many others. I've chosen to use this one, as his other nickname, such as The Serpent, is far too cool, and I'd much rather this piece of human garbage be remembered by the silliest handle possible. Yeah, let's just remember him as Cha Charles Sabraj, The Bellend. Um, but I think The Serpent is the name of the, uh, the Netflix, uh, like, series. Deus Ex Machina? I always thought it was Deus Ex Machina. Well, there we go. Fortunately, it's not something I say very often. 
It's at this point in the, that the absolute legend Hermann Nippenberg, third secretary of the Dutch embassy in Thailand, enters the story. In my experience, the third secretary to any embassy is usually a spy, allegedly, but there doesn't seem to be any reference to this in any of the voluminous reporting about him. Having said that, Nippenberg does seem to have been a natural born investigator, piecing together Sabraj's deeds and identities with a dogged precision which wouldn't be out of place in a Le Car novel. Le Carre. Le Carre novel, right? Uh, he's definitely not a spy, though, and any suggestions to that effect would be highly irresponsible. <laughs> okay, that's. I feel like we've couched our language enough, especially as this was decades ago, um, and also based on like publicly informa available information. Nippenberg first encountered the Sabrage case when the families of Hank and Cornelia contacted the embassy, concerned that their children had broken contact. Nippenberg, believing the parents had a right to feel that the embassy would help them, began investigating. After successfully requesting dental records, he was able to give some closure to the Bintaja and Hempke families by successfully identifying their bodies. By his own account, Nippenberg was shocked by the cruelty of the murders, especially the fact that the victims had been burned alive, and he became obsessed with bringing the killer or killers to justice oh my god i'm just like this story combined with my own experience as a kid as a do it you know traveling and uh having kids of my own i'm just like you will never leave the country <laughs> and i know i have to and i know they will want to go travel and do all that exciting stuff that young people do but i'm like oh my god please don't get murdered i'm so much more worried about you than i am worried about myself <laughs> it's so crazy just it really is just i feel like in the last five years and then having kids maybe five years before having kids and then having kids it's just like oh my god my perspective on life has been just fundamentally altered by the fact of like oh my god death is real i took one course in existential philosophy at uh, at new york university does anyone else feel that way or uh, is or does everyone feel that way i don't know because people still ride motorcycles like my uncle's got a motorcycle and i'm like dude you're like 60 years old what are you up to you're not aware that this will kill you <laughs> Like, multiple of my uncles, I think three of my uncles have had motorcycles at various points. One of my uncles has, like, seven of them. And one of them is insane. And he's too afraid to ride it. But he still rides these other bikes. And I'm like, dude. And he's a doctor. It's like, you've seen some sh my dude what are you up to after successfully requesting dental records he was able to give some closure to the bintaya and hemke families by successfully identifying their bodies by his own account Snipperberg was shocked by the cruelty of the murders especially the fact that the victims had been buried burned alive jesus and he became obsessed with bringing the killer or killers to justice i feel like i read that already i'm sorry if i did there were quite a few factors working against him first and foremost was the fact that his embassy once they had identified the bodies instructed him to drop the whole affair yeah, I mean, he's not hes not a policeman, is he? He's just an embassy, so hes he's done his job. It's like, okay, I'm sorry, but they're dead, and we've handed it over to the local police. At that point, I'll be like, oh, God, the local police are going to do all. Okay, who do I have to pay? They rightly pointed out that he wasn't a policeman, that sovereign nations don't have to put up with foreign officials meddling in their affairs, and that if this phantom, whom he only knew under the alias Alan Gautier, had uh, at the time was as dangerous as he thought, he himself was in significant peril. At one point, the embassy even sent him on leave to correct his behavior, which in diplomatic circles is the equivalent of hitting someone in the back of the head with a sock full of lead shavings. <laughs> oh my god. It's like... <laughs> Wait, I mean... Did he get permission to go out and find out about these bodies? Another obstacle was that he sounds like a good diplomat. Like he's doing, he's representing, I guess he's not really representing his country abroad, he's investigating a crime. Yeah, okay, I get it. But he's the sort of guy that I would want. Like if you contacted them, some guy who actually gives a shit, that's who I'd like to find rather than some government bureaucrat who's more interested in, I don't know, what do diplomats do? Eat Ferrero Rochers at parties? <laughs> It's just my, from like adverts as a kid, Ferrero Rocher. Ferrero Rocher is like surprisingly cheap. I always thought it was some super fancy thing. And then I'm like, oh, and it's not, it's fine, but it's not that fancy, is it? It's not like they portrayed in those adverts. Do other, was that just a British thing? Is Ferrero Rocher even an American thing? I know most listeners are Americans, but they're like, oh, Ferrero, there's this little chocolate wrapped in like a foil thing. And they'd have giant piles of them being like handed around at parties where people wore tuxedos as a kid and i was like bloody da <laughs> not an interesting tangent simon let's get back to it another obstacle was the generally chaotic nature of this part of the world at the time border security across much of the middle east and asia was laughable partly because of the generally less developed nature of the countries in question and partly owing to paper records and minimal routine information being shared between agencies it could take day yeah it was even 10 years ago 
when a uh, little, little, little over 10 years ago, I was doing this. You'd cross over like a border and it would, there'd be no electronics. There'd be a dude with a typewriter. Be like, okay, here's your, here's your visa thing. Don't lose it. And I lost, I lost my exit card one time for some random country. It was a massive hassle. And I was on a bus and everyone had to wait. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I thought it was in my backpack. And eventually they, they like, they just are like, okay, the stamp in the passport seems good. And they let me go. But it was, a, it was a hassle and you just don't want to be in those buildings for too long because they're like in the middle of the nowhere and you're like wait am i supposed to bribe somebody in this situation you just have no idea what's going on <laughs> it could take days weeks or even months to establish a broader crossing had taken place and in some of the regions sabranj was active months or longer for autopsies to take place or bodies to be identified there was also the fact that in many of these countries the police not to put too fine a point on it could be bought for half a tin of bacon grease this was combined with the general incompetence of law enforcement whose main duties typically involved dealing with petty theft, collecting protection money, and beating up poor people who got a bit too lippy. Uh, yeah, this, uh, Chris writes, this might sound a bit harsh or even a bit libelous, but it is broad, yes, yeah, we're not really, we're not calling a specific person out, we're just saying, like, in generalities, it wasn't very good. Um, so I don't think there's any libel there. But let's just say, allegedly. Uh, but it is broadly accepted fact that the professional and motivated security agencies we see in most of these regions today simply didn't exist in the 70s. Um, I don't know, like, bribing and stuff? Not that I ever bribed anybody, but there's definitely, like, especially for, like, speeding tickets and stuff, or, like, m driving infractions. Bribing was all the time in these, like, random, like, uh... Yeah, I'm not going to mention any countries, but that like typical backpacker route, it's like, yo, yo, bribing was happening. And it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The it would be more like the police would just be like, yeah, the fine's this. And you'd be like, okay, do I get like, okay. One example was a, a guy was riding a motorbike without a helmet. The police pulled him over and said, yo, you can't be riding that bike without a helmet. And he was like, oh, okay, oh, okay, great. What's going to happen? He's like, well, the fine's like, I don't know, like, the fine's whatever. So he pays the fine. And then he's like, do I get a ticket? And he's like, no. And the police, and then he's like, well, so what do I do now? And the policeman's just like, well, on your way. And he's like, but I still don't have a helmet, do I? <laughs> the police were just is like, well, it's not my problem, is it? Carry on, I find you, done my job. And I get the feeling that wasn't really a fine. Thus it was that on at least three occasions, Sabraj and his associates were questioned in direct connection with homicides and disappearances that they were responsible for and simply walked away. In one question, in one particularly memorable incident, Sabraj and Marie Leclerc were, to, were able to escape police questioning by assuming the identities of a different set of victims whose passports they had stolen. It was while they were conning and murdering their way across the entire Eastern Hemisphere that Nippenberg patiently collected newspaper clippings, read through the police reports, and interviewed law enforcement and witnesses for years, patiently matching aliases and building a case against Sabraj, whose real name he uncovered during this process, all against the wishes of his embassy, his wife, and many of the police in the jurisdictions in question. And it's at this point we realize why this man is such an absolute legend. Things fall apart. Back in the early days, Sabraj had run a scam on three young French ex-policemen, stealing their passports and then miraculously recovering them, earning their undying gratitude. These three men had been central members of Sabraj's coterie in Thailand, helping him with his business, but unaware of the murders. After the death of Charmaine Corot and the disappearance of Hank and Cornelia, they became suspicious and broke into Sabraj's office during one of his frequent trips abroad. They were horrified to discover a cache of dozens upon dozens of stolen passports and other documents correctly, assuming that at least some of these must have been obtained by murder. They fled Thailand with the assistance of a brave and generous couple who were acquitted, acquainted with Sabraj and willing to put their lives on the line to help them. And being ex-policemen, they stopped off and told the Thai police everything they knew before they left. I get the feeling... I don't know if this is going to be... It may be like my expectations are way too low. But I feel not much is going to happen with that absolute mountain of evidence that the Thai police have just been presented with. This led to the Thai authorities executing a search warrant on Zabraj's apartment complex. Okay, well, I mean, all this talk about the police not being very good. This seems like some good action taking place. As well as granting Nippenberg, who was back in Thailand doing whatever third secretaries do, permission to attend the search. They uncovered dozens of passports and travel documents, the kind of documents no traveler would willingly leave behind, as well as industrial quantities of laxatives, poisons, and sedatives. As a result of this, the Thai authorities were able to issue a uh, arrest warrant for Alan Gauthier, 
uh, for multiple murders, and Nippenberg, with the help of Sabraj's neighbor, was able to seriously ramp up his own independent investigation. It was through these efforts, and in conjunction with Interpol, who had a sizable file on Sabraj without yet being able to match his aliases, that Nippenberg was eventually able to connect him and his followers to multiple murders. It's worth noting here that Interpol are acknowledged both generally and by Nippenberg himself to be the other heroes of this story, their dogged and ceaseless pursuit of Sabraj being a major factor in his eventual capture. Cool. It's nice to see, like from our earlier police not doing anything, to Interpol, Thai police, this embassy dude, getting the kind of support that they want. I like it. This makes this is like my favorite part of these episodes. Whereas like someone gets their comeuppance and it's like the the noose is closing, Charles. Upon discovering that the three Frenchmen had flown the coop, Sabraj put two and two together and fled with his remaining followers to Calcutta and Delhi. While in these places, he found the time to murder a Jewish academic, Avoni Yakov, Avoni Yakov, and used his passport to travel to Singapore. How, does this dude just look like everyone? Isn't this dude like? Wasn't he like half Vietnamese? So he's definitely an Asian dude. How on earth does he look like this random Jewish guy? <laughs> I mean, that's not like two groups who I think look similar. <laughs> And he used his passport to travel to Singapore. Once there, he traveled back to Thailand, murdered an American to assume his identity, and brought him by police to be questioned about his three ex gendarmes allegations, as well as Nipperberg's findings. Okay, wait, so they arrested him? Okay. Did we just skip that? It's like, yeah, he stole this guy's identity, and then he was brought in. Okay, great. Much, of, much to Herman Nippenberg and Interpol's frustration, Sabraj and his followers were released after payment of a 300,000 baht bribe. This is just under $10,000. Not the smallest sum, but a ridiculously low one for a bribe to get away with murder. Oh my god. Even in the 70s. So what's that today? Maybe like 50, 60 grand American? That is a ton of money. But uh, yeah, to like get out for murder and potentially escape, is uh, that's a deal. Because... Was it? In, I can't remember because it was yesterday. But did we talk about the Bangkok Hilton? Uh, I've made videos about like prisons abroad and stuff. That is that is a rough one. You don't want to go there. After this, they stopped briefly in Malaysia, where Sabranj appears to have turned his attention to cleaning his own house. While the facts have never been firmly established, it's believed Sabranj sent his longtime lieutenant A. J. Chowdhury to a mining town in Malaysia on a jewel trading errand and probably murdered or had him murdered there. Either way, Chowdhury disappeared without a trace from that moment, missing presumed dead. Sabraj then headed to Bombay and attempted to rob and drug a Frenchman named Jean-Luc Solomon, only to have him succumb to the poison and die. This led him and his followers to flee to New Delhi, where he, Marie, and two other women somehow persuaded a group of 60 French engineering students to hire them as tour guides. It was here where he's lost none of his charm, apparently, through all these murders. It was here that Sabraj finally overreached himself by attempting to run his poison people and nurse them back to health scam on all 60 of them at once. Sabraj made up some pills which he claimed were anti-malarial, some reports say anti-dysentery, but never having dosed people on this scale before, it all went horribly wrong. For all you budding, budding criminals out there, it's worth noting that the drug receptivity it's worth noting that the drug receptivity of individuals can vary wildly across relatively small sample sizes, and if you want to get uniform effect across, let's say, 60 people of different ages, weights, genders, and states of health, carefully calibrated dosages need to be applied. This is absolutely what Sabraj did not do. And when 20 of the students passed out, moaning and thrashing and presumably shitting everywhere because of the laxatives mixed in with the sedatives, the burlier student smelled a rat, among other things, overpowered him and called the police. Excellent. Char, what are you doing? Just why are you trying to rat run your scam on 60 people at once? That's insane. Living at large in TR and France. Sabraj and his followers were locked up in TR Maximum Security Facility, where we began our tale. Sabraj, having swallowed a bunch of gemstones left over from a previous scam, proceeded to bribe his way into being king of the prison. In the meantime, Marie Leclerc and two other women, Barbara Smith and Mary Ellen Ether, had been locked up in the women's wing. Sabraj made no attempt to look after his followers, possibly as he was supremely confident of their loyalty. As far as Marie Leclerc, who could rate a whole, who could rate a whole video on her own, was concerned, he was right. But Barbara and Mary Ellen were addicts he'd picked up in Bombay, classic lost girls who'd only recently fallen under his sway. The combination of horrific conditions and intensive interrogation led them to cave quite quickly, spilling the beans on the entire operation 
so far as they knew it. Both women subsequently attempted suicide. Sabraj was sentenced to 12 years despite doing his level best to turn the trial into a circus and disrupted at every turn. A sentence he ironically might have avoided if it ever attempted or even thought to look after someone other than himself. Yeah, or if it would never just been a horrible serial killer. Also, this guy killed a lot of people. It was during his luxurious stay at Tahar that Sabraj realized he wouldn't be locked up for long enough to avoid the Thai warrant for his arrest, which was valid for 20 years, and would almost certainly result in his execution. So he engineered his shambolic prison escape by drugging the guards at his birthday party. After his re-arrest and admittedly far less luxurious stint in prison, he was released in 1997 after 20 years. Sabraj claimed French citizenship on the strength of his stepfather and was allowed to settle there. <laughs> really, Brantz? You want this dude? While in France, Sabraj conducted himself as a celebrity, charging large sums of money for interviews, appearing on several television shows, and even charging himself out as some sort of birthday clown, by which I mean that you could pay a few thousand dollars to have lunch or dinner with the celebrity murderer. What the f***? This, how did this guy? I mean, I just come back to the idea this guy must have infinite charm because he is literally a piece of f***ed serial killer. He is a serial killer. And people are like, yeah, let's have that guy be our dinner entertainment. You f***ing stupid? During this time, an Indian film production house paid for the rights to his life story, and it looked as if everything was coming up roses for Sabraj. Herman Nippenberg, who had by this time retired and remarried, said he found this period particularly galling, and we can only guess what life was like for the victims of his, uh, for the families of his victims. A dog returneth to its vomit. A dog returneth to its vomit, so a fool returns to his folly is a biblical verse i struggled to understand during my years in catholic school thankfully as an adult i'm no longer compelled to analyze abstruse bible quotes but the case of charles Sabraj made me suddenly understand this one Sabraj was a free man living at large so long as he remained in france nobody could touch him for all the crimes he'd committed his warrants had lapsed almost everywhere except nepal and a couple of other places and uh, the two people who the two people who knew pretty much everything he'd done were no threat. AJ had been disappeared, and Marie Leclerc, paroled after being diagnosed with terminal ovarian cancer, was now dead. So when in 2003, Zabraj traveled to Nepal, one of the few countries still actively seeking him, what are you up to? <laughs> what? <laughs> also, I guess there's no extradition between France and Nepal, otherwise Nepal would be like, yo, France, give us that guy, we want to chop his head off. Um, You'd just be like, okay, look, I'm never going to Nepal. You just have to accept that. You just have to accept that, child. It's the one place looking for you still. Why on earth would you go there? It's Nepal. It's not somewhere you have to go. He went there to set up a mineral water business, and this was like a dog returning to its vomit. Within a very short time, a journalist spotted him walking down a Kathmandu street. A casino manager photographed him compulsively gambling, and he was arrested for multiple murders. <laughs> you have made a huge error. Sabraj's arrest made headlines around the world, but very few people would have been as excited as Herman Nippenberg, now retired and living in New Zealand. Nippenberg says, I was sitting down with my wife having breakfast eating pancakes, and I was thinking I'll never have to go into an office again. Then there was a phone call. I said, it's a miracle. He's been arrested in Nepal. I have to be quick. I ran down the stairs to my garage where there were six boxes of evidence that I had taken all over the world, and I fished out one of the files and called Interpol. Nippenberg's evidence was crucial in securing Sabraj's conviction, and to this day, Charles Sabraj, Charles Sabraj, the Kini killer, is serving a life sentence in Nepal. Excellent. I don't know what Nepalese prisons are like, but I'm going to assume that they're not very nice. Uh, good. I'm glad this absolute piece of is in jail. Dismembered Appendices Number 1. Nobody knows how many people Sabraj killed. Even around the known killings, there are discrepancies and uncertainties which might never be resolved. It's important, however, to respect and remember his victims. So here's a list of the people that we know for certain were murdered by Charles Sabraj. Teresa Norton, Vitaly Hakim, Shemaine Caro, Hank Bentaya, Cornelia Hemke, Connie Brozic, Laurent Ormond Carrier, Avoni Jacob, Jean Luc Solomon. Number 2. Of the many accounts of his life, the life and crimes of Charles Sabraj by Australian husband and wife journalists Richard Neville and Julie Clark is probably the most comprehensive. One caveat, though, is that it relies heavily on Sabraj's own testimony, much of which is obviously fabricated and all of which he subsequently denied, which he would, having for some reason admitted to a bunch of murders during the interviews. 
Number 3. Sobranj's story is so convoluted and confused, it's not actually possible to compile a coherent account which is sure to be 100% true. For what we actually know, he was heavily indebted to Hermann Nippenberg and, Neville and Neville and Clark, as well as many other journalists who have followed his trail and sat through his long narcissistic ramblings. Having sat through quite a few of these self-serving, lion-infested monologues for this video, I applaud their sacrifice. And we applaud your sacrifice, Chris. Number 4. In 2007, Sabraj married his lawyer's 20-year-old daughter, Nahita Biswas, who had acted as an interpreter between them in a prison wedding. It knows no end, Sabraj. I have no idea how you do this. Nepali, authority, Nepali authorities, Nepalese authorities deny the validity of the marriage and Nahita denies Sabranj ever committed any murders. According to Nahita, Shal is a complex person who isn't a bad man, proving at least some of Sabranj's talents haven't faded with age. Number 5. If some elements of this story remind you of Charles Manson, yet yeah, no kidding. This is no coincidence. Manson was apparently a hero to Sabraj, and he himself says he consciously attempted to emulate his career, which is described in an excellently written video on this very channel. <laughs> Self praise there. Number six. Thankfully, it seems unlikely Sabraj will ever be released, despite Nepal's habit of letting elderly prisoners go. Now, it is letting elderly prisoners go, especially the biggest piece of <laughs> is crazy. Or sick prisoners. I have no sympathy for. Like, I don't care if this guy is dying in prison of a horrible disease. He doesn't deserve to be released. One thing that drove, like, I just found unbelievable was when um, Scotland released the Lockerbie bomber because he was dying of cancer and he lived like another three years or something and i'm like he's the lockerbie bomber he killed like 200 people he's a terrorist you f***ing kidding me scotland you smoking crack it blows my mind that that happens that that is a real piece of history the lockerbie bomber now in his late 70s and survivor of several heart surgeries, multiple appeals for his release have been denied and there are still outstanding indictments against him for other murders. So it looks like the Bikini Killer's going to rot in prison forever. Excellent! Glad to hear it. This has been an episode of The Casual Criminalist. Uh, wonderfully, for the last, I don't know however long this has been, there's been no uh, noises. So I'm probably just going to carry on and record another Casual Criminalist right after this because I'll take whatever I can get, construction people. I'll take the silence. Uh, if you're enjoying this show, please do consider leaving it a review if you're listening. Um, Apple Podcasts, Spotify Now's ratings, fantastic stuff. Uh, if you're watching on uh, YouTube, subscribe, like, leave a comment. And I'll see you next time. <laughs>